So just as an aside, um, and I apologize that this has that this it had to happen this way, but um, the uh, the grading TA neglected to mark people down for being late for a few of the last homework assignments. So if you did hand in a homework assignment and it was late, but you miraculously didn't get the penalty, I went in and changed it, so now you have the penalty. Um, if only because it wouldn't be fair to the people who handed in homework late, homework late before that got the penalty and handed it on time afterwards. Like, I, I guess he forgot to add the penalty or something, but it's been added in. So go double check your grades uh, if you've handed in any late homeworks, uh, just to make sure that you know uh, that that you to prepare appropriately for the final. Um, yeah, I, I, sorry about that. Puts me in a very awkward spot. I agree. Uh, and I'm sure it isn't fun for you guys either. Anyway, um, so last time we were uh, talking about gravity. Um, and uh, one thing that I did is I computed the gravitational force that an astronaut on the ISS should feel due to the Earth. And the way we did that is we plugged in the mass of the Earth, the gravitational constant, or equivalently just the gravitational parameter of the Earth. Um, which is just g times the mass of the Earth, uh, divided it by the distance that the object is from the, uh, that the ISS is from the Earth. Uh, this is Re, or from the center of mass of the Earth, Re plus 400 kilometers, uh, and then just calculated and it worked out to be about, you know, 8.7-ish meters per second squared. And so this was surprising because what is it, like, how does it make sense that they experience uh, some non-zero gravitational force and yet, we say that they're in zero g or they're in microgravity or they're in free fall or whatever. So what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about free fall. So instead of directly working with the astronauts aboard the ISS yet, let's consider some separate scenarios that'll help us understand how to solve this puzzle. So suppose that you're on a trampoline. Um, and just as you leave the, like the mat, like as you're about to leave the mat and get some lift, get some air, you drop your phone. Um, wrong place. I just want to get this written down so people can have it. Um, so the the idea here is uh, we're we're, we're going to try to answer the question from this perspective. What what happens? Like what happens from your perspective? So so before before you say leave uh, or or just as you're leaving the surface of the trampoline, it's you, and you have some initial velocity upwards, right? And then an instant later, you drop your phone. And now you're slightly higher, perhaps. And you have some other velocity, but your phone also has that upwards velocity, right? Because it's not like you threw it down, you kind of just let go of it. So the, the question is, is what would you perceive uh, as what happens to the phone? So we, can, we, we know the math to do this, so we can do that. Um, Clearly the phone has the same initial velocity as us because you're not throwing it up, you're not throwing it down, so it's just leaving you. Uh, and it feels the same acceleration that we feel downwards when we're, uh, so we're going upwards, but our speed is decreasing because we feel an acceleration downwards. So let's just compute the vertical height after some time t of both me and the phone. It would be whatever that vertical, let's call it v naught, uh, uh, v naught minus one half gt squared, you guys all know how to do this by now. And the vertical position of the phone is also v naught minus one half gt squared, because both i and it have the same initial velocity, and we have the same initial height. So what does that entail? It entails that the v naught t, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah I dropped a t. Um, but the initial position, but the initial position is zero for our reference. Um, 
The point here is that the y position of the phone and the y position of me are the same. Um, so so what's, the, what's the consequence of this? Well, the consequence is that from my perspective, the phone moves neither up nor down. At, that is, at least while we're both still in the air. Um, and so, what this this implies that you know at How least. How much did I miss? How much did I miss? Uh, five minutes. Check the recording. Um, Wait, which one? The the implication here is that uh -huh. it's floating in front of me, right? Like as I go up, it just kind of stays there and it's just floating. Um, and so this is, so, so that's all it means for something to be in quote unquote zero G. Um, so, so when we say something's in zero G, all we mean is that you feel only one force, gravitational force, um, and everything else feels that exact same force. So everything else would be falling at the same rate as you. So <clears throat> another, another example that's often used in these pictures is, let's say you're at the top of an elevator shaft in an elevator and the cable breaks. Well, what happens to you? Well, certainly uh, you don't go slamming into the ceiling because that would mean that the elevator is falling faster than you. But you also won't stay attached to the ground, at least not for long, because the, the ground's falling as fast as you are. So what ends up happening is that you, kind of, you, you would start to float around the cabin of the uh, the cabin of the elevator, and if you if you dropped a pencil or dropped a penny from your uh, from say your pocket while you're floating about the cabin of the elevator, you would realize that it ju would just float in front of you. Um, so is the zero g on the ISS only in the perspective of the astronauts aboard it? Uh, so zero g is just a misnomer, really. That, that that's what this boils down to, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll explain a little bit more. Um, Uh, once we get through this whole argument. But so, th so this whole idea that two things can fall at the same rate and it looks like they're floating, well, this just means that, those, that both those objects are in free fall. For example, if I'm skydiving and, I, and somebody else is skydiving, from my perspective and from their perspective, we're both floating relative to each other. We're also both in free fall. So it turns out that... Um, any object in free fall, free fall meaning there's only one force acting on the object and it's a gravitational force. Oh, I think my headset just disconnected. Can you guys still hear me? Testing, testing, testing. Okay, that's weird. Oh, okay. Anyway, um, all, fr all free fall means, all zero G means is that gravity is the only force acting on you. One way to see this, by the way, and, and this is kind of above your pay grade, but um, if somebody experienced zero forces, then you could certainly say that they're not experiencing, that then, then everything should be floating. But it turns out that um, gravity, for some unusual reason that's, that's not very well understood, um, is completely indistinguishable from just accelerating. So that is to say, um, if two things accelerate at the same rate, even if one of them is due to gravity, they'll behave identically. And the reason that's important is because it just means that you kind of don't treat gravity as if it were a force that you feel. Um, so, so when, and, and the reason for that is it's, it's due to Einstein, it's called the equivalence principle, but that's neither here nor there. The, the whole point is just that when we say zero G, we mean only gravity. And that's because um, 
the things that are actually, the thing that you actually feel when you're say standing on the ground is not the gravity. It's the ground pushing you back up, right? That's why you feel your weight on your feet. You don't feel your weight at your center of mass. Um, but anyway, let, let's talk another example. Um, hopefully you guys remember that Archer problem with the apple and the falling, the, the falling apple and the Archer. Um, so we can study that in a slightly more, a slightly different scenario um, by supposing that, that's not how you spell Archer, by supposing that the Archer was initially level with the apple. So here we have, you know, say the Archer is on some platform. Let's see how good my stick figure drawings are. Yeah, that's not bad. Got your little arrow. Right, the, arch, the Archer is on the platform. And they're aiming and, and they're trying to hit the falling apple that's going to fall out of the tree, right? Uh, so here's our falling apple. So just as before in the archer problem, <laughs> yeah, uh, in the archer problem, the trick was is the archer should aim directly at the apple. And the reason for that is because they both, both the apple and the arrow fall at the same rate. Now, the same logic applies here. It's just now the angle is different, but still the archer should aim directly at the apple because just for, for every meter that the apple falls, the arrow will also go down one meter. So it'll still hit it while it's falling. So <clears throat> what we can see is that the, from, from, this, from, from this problem, or from this example, um, the vertical positions of the arrow and the apple are always the same. They're both falling at the same rate. So it's fair to say that the arrow is in free fall. Um, because, and, and just as I defined above, in free fall, free fall just means gravity is the only force acting. And so in, in, the, in the arrow's case, gravity is the only force acting on the apple. And so just as, the, uh, just as when you are at the, uh, on the trampoline and you drop your phone, the, uh, the phone just looks like it's just floating in front of you, from the apple's perspective, while they're both falling, it'll just look like the arrow is just coming straight at the apple the whole time, even though it's actually following a parabolic trajectory, right? And so from the apple's perspective, it would also seem like the arrow is experiencing quote unquote zero G because it's just moving straight, it's not falling at all. Um, and so, so yes, zero G is almost a, uh, it's not quite a perspective thing, what it is, is it's a disregard of the fact, or it, it's, a, it's an acknowledgement of the fact that we don't feel gravity. Like as humans, we don't, we don't feel gravity. Um, so, but, but the important lesson from the Archer example is that the horizontal motion, the horizontal motion of the arrow doesn't affect the fact that the arrow, that's not on a straight line, doesn't affect the fact that the arrow is in free fall. So what we've learned from these two examples is in the case of the trampoline, the initial vertical velocity doesn't affect whether the arrow, whether the phone is in free fall, because both the phone and you have some initial velocity, but you're both still in free fall because you're both, you're both accelerating downward at the same speed. Further, the horizontal motion, this is perpendicular velocity now, doesn't affect whether or not the object is in free fall. Do we feel gravity if we try to escape the atmosphere of the Earth? Um, no, no, you wouldn't, you, you still would not feel it. What you would feel is the acceleration pushing you back against your seat. Um, and the, the reason why, so, so, so if you accelerated upwards in a rocket at 10 meters per second squared, all, you, would, you would feel precisely twice as heavy. And the reason for that is because your rocket has to apply a force vertically that's equal to two times mg. So you're feeling the force that the rocket applies on your feet, not the force of gravity on you downwards. Um, but, and we can talk about that uh, again later. But the, the, important part is, the important part here is that, yeah, you feel the normal force from the seat. The important part here is that 
the velocity of like whatever the velocity of the object as long as the object is just uh experiencing gravity it's in free fall whether it's moving vertically or horizontally whatever as long as gravity is the only force the object is in free fall and so from its perspective it would be floating um think of like when you're at the top of a roller coaster when you're going over and when you're just falling down the only thing that's pulling you down or the only thing that's affecting your motion is the earth's gravity and so that's why you feel like that that lump in your stomach that like oh i'm falling and that's because you are experiencing free fall in that scenario and apparently i haven't experienced this personally apparently that's what it's like all the time while you are uh on the international space station for example you just have this weightless feeling because gravity is the only thing that is pushing you or that's pulling you down uh shawshank so following up on that what about while skydiving yeah so while skydiving you are experiencing free fall except uh after like the first second or so your uh the air resistance is significant is significant and in fact it's so much so significant in fact that it um can match the gravitational force and then you start to feel that and so then you don't feel like you're in free fall anymore because you have air resistance um yes cody the in so the so in the iss the astronauts are just in constant free fall so let's let me continue here so what so what happens if we move this tree further away right if the tree gets further away what do you need to do in order to hit the apple in the same amount of time you need to fire it faster and faster right so so the idea here is in order to not hit the ground in order to hit the apple before you hit the ground you have to fire your arrow faster and faster as it gets further away meaning as you fire as you feel it, your arrow will land further and further away as your arrow goes faster and that's that's not surprising right and so what we can do is we can actually just generalize it and this thing is or uh, take take the extreme of this idea this and this idea is called newton's canon named after a uh, smart boy isaac newton of course um and the fact that the earth is round and again if you're a flat earther feel free to leave um i'll have none of that in here or better yet maybe stick around and then i'll like uh maybe i'll convince you otherwise so now let's imagine that we have our earth and this is certainly not scale and let's say that we have a cannon on the earth right and it shoots a cannonball well at a normal speed it shoots a cannonball maybe it lands 100 meters in front but if you double the gunpowder maybe it lands 150 meters in front and if you keep increasing the speed that the cannonball falls or that the cannonball has it'll go further and further just like in our apple and archer example however notice that the earth is also falling away quote unquote falling away from the cannonball because the earth is round it's going to curve underneath the cannonball and so if you fire and by the way remember these cannonballs after they've been fired just like the arrow these cannonballs cannonball cannonballs cannonballs are in free fall the only force they experience is gravity as you fire them faster and faster they go further and further until eventually you fire it so fast that the earth falls away from it at precisely the same speed that the cannonball is falling down due to gravity due to the earth's gravitational pull and so this is a way that you can fire a cannon and hit yourself in the back of the head now doing so would very much kill you so i do not advise that by any means um in fact you'd probably have to fire your cannon at around 17,000 ish kilometers per hour very fast very dangerous um however it's doable and in fact what this is called is an orbit right the idea here is that you fire your it, it, your projectile is in free fall it is moving sufficiently fast that for every say centimeter that it would fall due to gra earth's gravity the earth's surface has gone down by a centimeter because it's round um and so <clears throat> perhaps you can see why this would have to be the case uh that that this is how and and uh can an orbit be that low to hit yourself in the back no okay so so i'll talk about that in a minute but um the 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 point here is that once an object is in orbit all it's doing is it is 
just falling the entire way. So it is always in free fall. Um, and so all we have to do is now just consider, okay, well, instead of having a cannonball that was fired really fast, now just imagine that it's the International Space Station that was put into, that was lifted up 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth by a rocket and then put, and then pushed horizontally very, very quickly. So all the International Space Station is doing is moving so fast that the ground falls away beneath it exactly as quickly as the International Space Station is falling due to Earth's pull. Um, and so because the only force acting on it is gravity, it is just undergoing projectile motion, um, the International Space Station and everything inside of it is in free fall. And so what that means is that they're not experiencing zero gravity. They're experiencing only gravity. It's just everything else is experiencing precisely that same only gravity at that time. So what happens from the, from the astronauts' perspectives is they're floating around because the cabin that they're in is falling at precisely the same rate that they are. So it'd be just like being in a falling elevator, just like dropping your phone while you're going up on a trampoline. Um, it's just for them, it lasts basically forever because they never hit the ground. They just fall away from the ground. <clears throat> this is what an orbit is. An orbit is just moving sufficiently fast that the object, or, or rather that uh, it's moving sufficiently fast that your uh, angular position, so say, say this is say your angle theta, your angular position changes without changing your radial distance, the distance that you are from that center of mass. Um, uh, so, so to answer Christine's question, um, I mean, in reality, no, you could not have an orbit that low. However, on the moon, for example, where there is no atmosphere and hence there's no drag, you can have very, very low orbits. You could probably have an orbit that's as low as like a few kilometers up. Uh, but it'd be dangerous because, you know, one wrong move and you crash into the crash into the dirt at 500 meters per second or something like that. Because, you know, if you're low, like, like imagine that, imagine that there was no air on Earth, but here's Mount Everest. If your orbit is too low, you'll hit Mount Everest at orbital speeds, which would not be good. So typically we put orbits higher even on objects that don't have very, that, that don't have atmosphere because, you know, we don't want to crash into stuff. It also turns out that um, <clears throat> that it's harder to get into a low orbit than it is to get in the, or it, if you were going to say the moon, um, it is easier to stay in a high orbit than it is to go into a lower orbit. Do you have to orbit at higher velocity if you are orbiting lower? Yes, that's true, and th that is correct, Henry. And I'm actually going to talk about uh, either today or on Friday. I will go over why that's the case, and that's. You can either show that from Kepler's laws or you can show that from Newton's laws, either way works. Um, just one more thing that I wanna talk about, perhaps it, like this whole falling away from the earth thing isn't quite precise, right? Because uh, it, uh, while it's a perfectly fine way to intuit it, it's not quite precise because um, your, uh, your velocity tangent to the earth is always changing. Uh, while this is happening. So, so it's hard to make this argument that I've just described precise. So I'm going to give another argument for why orbits are just projectile motion um, that can be made a little bit more precise. So imagine that, again, an object is in free fall. It's experiencing only gravity. And then, so, so let's say that it's in a, uh, a parabolic trajectory, just like we expect a normal projectile motion to experience. Um, so that object uh, might have a trajectory that looks like this or something like that, right? Starts off being shot upwards and then it uh, peaks and then it comes back downwards. And maybe this is the X and Y position. Um, so there is some, uh, at, at, at the very, very top of its, of its arc, it's traveling precisely horizontally, right? 
<clears throat> so there is an object from geometry, hopefully you guys remember this from like however many years ago it was, called the circle of osculation. So, uh, osculation comes from, the, uh, comes from a Latin root meaning kiss. So this is like the kissing circle, which is a, a weird phrase. But the idea is that it, it just barely kisses the, uh, the, the path that you're interested in. So it's basically the, the circle that has the same radius of curvature, like it has, has the same uh, slopes and second derivatives at that point. So you can notice how this circle, or at least my attempt at the circle, is like, actually, I should probably do it even better. It's hard to get right, hard to draw these things well. Notice how like, well, it's good enough. At least over here, it's like basically touching the parabola. And there's, there's a formal definition for this. You can figure out the radius of this thing mathematically. But the important part is that this object only feels a force downwards due to gravity. And this circle of osculation has a certain radius. And the radius of that circle basically depends on how steep this, uh, this parabola is. Call this r sub osc. Um, and so you can imagine that the less steep the parabola is, the bigger the circle of osculation, the steeper the parabola, the smaller the circle of osculation. So the radius of that circle can be easily determined, right? So imagine at this point in time, imagine that it, were, it, that it was undergoing circular motion. Well, then it would be experiencing some sort of, um, it would be experiencing acceleration that's perpendicular to its velocity. Well, precisely at the top of this arc, that is, what ha that is what's happening. So what we can do is we can model the, uh, we can model the forces there as if they were circular, as if they were forces due to circular motion. So we can use the formula F equals mv squared over r. And in this case, it is the radius of osculation that we use there, i.e. if this object were traveling in a circle with the force downwards f and speed v, then the circle it would travel in would have the radius or would be the circle of osculation. And so if an object is moving near the surface of the Earth, then we know what that force is. That force downwards is approximately, anyway, it's mg. And so we can solve for the radius of the circle of osculation. It's v squared over g. So, but now, think of what happens as the radius of osculation goes up, right? As it goes, as this, as this, uh, this circle of osculation gets larger and larger, that means that this, the slope or the steepness of our, uh, parab of our parabolic shape, gets, it gets less and less steep, meaning the object goes further and further. And so what's, precisely what's happening here is that as the radius of osculation approaches the radius of the Earth, the, the, the object's path begins to resemble a straight line on the surface of the Earth, right? So, so imagine that we have a large circle of osculation here. It's hard to draw. Um, but a, as, as it gets less steep and less steep, or steeper, as, yeah, as it gets less and less steep, eventually, from the Earth's perspective, it's just moving in a straight line. And that, that, that critical uh, radius of osculation is the radius of the orbit. Um, and at that point, the object is just moving perfectly horizontally relative to the surface of the Earth, which means that it's just not gaining or losing height anymore, and hence it is in orbit. And so what we can do is we can actually solve for the velocity um, using this method of this whole radius of osculation business. It's just uh, square root of gr. And so if we plug in the um, if we plug in the radius of the Earth, you actually will get orbital velocity. You can solve for this, and it's like 17, uh, or it's 17,000 kilometers per hour, or 17,000 kilometers per hour, or something like that, kph. Uh, and that, so, so this tells you that if, you're, if the shape of your orbit approximately matches 
a circle of radius Earth, well then, voila, of course you're in the orbit of the Earth. Um, and obviously this can be made more rigorous. I wanted to introduce this method rather than this falling around the Earth business because it's not, this is, this is hard to make formal, whereas this, uh, this idea of the circle of oscillation really isn't. Um, but do come to office hours this week. Uh, tomorrow, if you want to talk about this more, I'm more than happy to. Um, right, so um, that's, that's what an orbit is. An orbit is literally just moving so fast that the Earth can't, that the Earth's, or that the pull of the Earth is not, so, is not so strong that you will hit the Earth because the Earth's curvature goes away before, before you hit the ground. Um, and obviously you can consider orbits about other things, not just the Earth. Like you could consider an orbit about Jupiter, which has, doesn't really have a ground. And then you just say, okay, well, the or a circular orbit about Jupiter would mean you're going so fast that the imaginary line you've drawn around Jupiter falls away sufficiently quickly that your velocity can keep up with that imaginary line. Um, that's all we mean by orbit. So we're going to talk about Kepler's laws now, um, which is kind of a, a takeaway or a kind of a, a move in a different direction. But these are all derived from New Newton's universal law of gravitation. So let's talk about Kepler Kepler's laws. So first and foremost, let me give the years that these were discovered. Uh, the first, I believe it was the first two that were discovered in 1609, and the third was discovered in 1619. So we're talking more than 400 years ago. And we're also talking like 200 years before Newton. So Kepler, just from data observed from the surface of the Earth, so you know, people just pointed telescopes at, in fact, it was a guy named Tycho Brahe um, who made these observations. He just mapped where all the planets were at various times of the year. So just from that data alone, just from the position of the planets in the sky, like looking up, he said the planets there, 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 there. Just from that, Kepler derived these laws empirically. So uh, just as a quick reminder, um, a law is an empirically derived phenomenon, meaning you observed something and then you came up with a formula that matched the data. Um, different from a theory, whereas a, a theory is a, uh, a, a set of it's a set of hypotheses or it's a model that is derived possibly, in, it's possibly inspired by data, but is derived from almost first principles. And then we check that said theory has, makes predictions that match the data. So uh, Einstein's relativity is, is a theory. It was derived from first principles rather than just taking the numbers and fitting a polynomial to it, which is basically what Newton did. Um, so just, just a little aside there. Uh, so Kepler's laws are mostly, are, are basically true. Like they're, they're, empir they're empirical laws. They're approximations, but they're empirical laws. So let's talk about Kepler's first law. I'd like to get through all three of these today, but I imagine that we probably won't. Um, so just, a, it's a phrase. Uh, the paths of bodies, and you can see this in the textbook too, by the way of bodies trapped in orbits. That's a, that's a terrible handwriting, I'm sorry. Trapped in orbits form closed ellipses or ellipses um, with the gravitating body. Gravitating, gravitating body at one of the foci. Foci? I'm going to say foci. And if I'm wrong, just make fun of me behind my back. All right, so there's a lot to deconstruct here. Um, this first law, by the way, was uh, first shown by Kepler in 1609 by proving that the orbit of Mars uh, had, or that, the, that Mars's path followed an elliptical trajectory the entire way around. Um, so let's just recall some geometry. Maybe not recall if you never learned this, but now's the time to learn it. Uh, the geometry of an ellipse is real, relatively straightforward. It's just a slightly more complicated circle. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to draw an ellipse. You'll have to forgive me because it's hard to draw a good ellipse. Good enough. So this length here, or that path is called the major axis. This path, is called the minor axis. 
Um, this length called A is called the semi-major axis. So the semi-major axis is just half the major axis. Semi-circle, half the circle, semi-major axis, half the major axis. In this case, it's a distance. It's, it's a characteristic length. Um, then we also have the semi-minor axis, which we don't usually give a name. Sometimes it's referred to as B, but we don't usually need to talk about it. That, I dropped an N. Semi-minor axis. Right. And then the other thing that makes an ellipse special is that it has two special points called foci. And these two points are equidistant from either side. Um, this distance here, a distance from the center to one of the foci, is, is the value e times a, where e is not 2.718. It is the eccentricity of the, uh, of the ellipse. And there are two special cases of eccentricity. When e is 1, the ellipse just becomes a line. When e is 0, the ellipse just becomes a circle. So you can think of an ellipse as being some midpoint or some, some, uh, some morphing of a circle and a line. You're basically stretching out a circle into a line. And the two extreme cases, when the uh, ex ex uh, eccentricity is 0 or 1, represent a circle, or the ellipse becomes a circle or a line, uh, respectively. Um, but what's, what's so special about these foci? Um, so these foci, it turns out, there are a few properties of them. But one of them is that <clears throat> the distance between the foci um, and then the sum of the distance between two points. So let's say we have a distance here. Let's call it x. It's called this distance y. So it turns out that the that 2 times ea plus xy is fixed for any point on the uh, any point on the ellipse on the ellipse and that's what makes the foci special basically the foci are those special points um, located a distance ea away from the center such that if you were to connect uh, th th this is that whole picture of how to draw an ellipse with uh, with a pair with some string. If you were to connect um, each of those foci to a point on the ellipse, and then add that distance to the um, to twice the eccentricity times the semi-major axis, then you get a constant. And this two ea that's a constant too. So really, it's just saying the foci are the two unique points on an ellipse that. Uh, if you add their distances to the point, you get a constant all the way around the ellipse. Now, it should be obvious then why a circle is also a form of an ellipse. There's only one focus for a circle, and that's because every point is the same distance away from the center. And so your E becomes zero, and so, you'll, so both of the foci come together and become one point. And so then the constant thing is just 2 times r. Of course, that's constant for a circle. right? OK, so <clears throat> that's the geometry of an ellipse. Um, regarding solar orbits, which is wh what we're going to talk about them in the context of, I hate, I hate this so much. Uh, I hate this so much. Um, there are some special names for special points on this ellipse. Um, the aphelion, or the aphel, oh, my headset did it again. The aphelion of an orbit is the point in the orbit furthest from the sun. So that's just a technical name, aphelion. Uh, similarly, the perihelion <coughs> is the point, point in the orbit closest to the sun. <coughs> So Kepler's first law says that the paths of bodies trapped in orbits form closed ellipses. So let's say that a planet is following along this ellipse, moving along. And the gravitating body, in the case of the sun and the earth, sun and the earth for example, the gravitating body being the sun, 
um, is at one of the fo foci. So what you would have is you'd have the sun, say here, and the earth up here, going following that trajectory around the sun. Now, the Earth's eccentricity is not nearly as high as I've drawn it. The Earth's eccentricity is very, very close to zero. So it is a nearly circular orbit, but it's not quite circular. So in that case, this point here would be the aphelion, because that's the furthest from the sun, and this point would be the perihelion. So when I say, now, now again, for the Earth, for the Earth-Sun system, because the ellipse, because the eccentricity is very low, the aphelion and the perihelion aren't very different from each other. It's like a few million miles, but the Earth is, you know, almost a hundred million miles away from the Sun, so it's like a few percent. But it is, you know, it is like that. It, it is useful to know those terms because other objects like uh, Pluto and comets have very, very much more eccentric orbits. Now we can describe the the shape of an ellipse mathematically like using a formula. And this is a common one that you'll see there are other formulations for it. But uh, the common one is r of theta equals a times 1 minus e squared divided by 1 minus e cosine of theta, where I need to define what these mean, uh, where r and theta correspond to the, it's so hard to draw an ellipse. Um, Good enough. It's like a sausage. Uh, where r and theta are mean the following. So you have a focus, say, here. And you measure theta relative to the line between the focus and the, fur and the, furthest, uh, the furthest side. So if we wanted to talk about a point here, this distance is r and this distance is theta, then for the eccentricity of this, uh, of this ellipse, you plug in E there, you plug in A for the semi-major axis, and um, that would describe how far away you are at a given angle theta. So this is like the functional definition of an ellipse. Um, and you'll note, by the way, that if you plug in E equals zero for a circle, you just get that uh, R is equal to A, which is precisely the formula for a circle. It's every point is equidistant from the center of the circle. Um, further, if we plug in, let me jot that down just for you guys. Uh, if we plug in E equals zero, we get that R of theta equals A, and that implies that it's a circle, which is a good check. If we plug in E equals one, we get that R of theta equals zero, except when theta is uh, zero or pi, which means that you have a line. Uh, the reason that means you have a line, by the way, is because it means that, let's say that uh, your focus is here, here's where your semi-major axis would be. Let's say that you were at some angle theta. Well, then that, that then the point that you would draw would be zero units away. And that would be, the point you would draw would be zero units away for all directions, except when theta is zero, in which case the point would just be some distance away. And that's just the line. So, um, this is a, it's, it's, it's a useful fact to know that uh, orbits form ellipses. Now, there's a question of how accurate is this really? And for simple, for sufficiently simple, simple systems, it's pretty good. Um, so first, so, so there's a few, a few things to note here. First, um, gravity is a two-way force, right? The planets pull on the sun just as much as the sun pulls on gravity. However, the sun doesn't move nearly as much because it weighs a lot more. So really, the focus, the, 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 the object that goes at the, at the location of one of the foci of your ellipses is not the center of mass of the object doing the tugging, but really, it's the center of mass of the whole system belongs at the focus. Now, for the Earth-Sun system, the focus of the, or the center of mass of that system is like 200 kilometers away from the center of the sun. It's, it's, it's very much so not very far. It's still inside the sun. So you can more or less just put it, put the sun at the focus. However, for Jupiter, which is both further away and a lot more massive for the interaction between the Jup Jupiter and the sun, the focus actually would be just outside the sun's actual radius. So you'd have to put the center of mass 
of that combined system at the focus. And then the sun would go around in a little ellipse and Jupiter would go around in a big ellipse. Um, a second point that makes this slightly less correct is that this description of um, gravitational forces always, always reduced to ellipses is only true if there's only two gravitating bodies. And when there are exactly two gravitating bodies, this statement is precisely true once you make the center of mass correction. However, the real solar system has a bunch of different things. Um, and it has a bunch of different things, all of which are pulling on each other. And so the actual orbits of the bodies are not going to be perfect ellipses. They're all going to interact with each other. And it's going to tug on each other and change their angular momentum ever so slightly. And third, it turns out that because Newton's law of gravitation, universal law of gravitation, is only an approximation to Einstein's general theory of relativity, turns out that, that this whole business of, like, even if you had just two bodies, and even if you accounted for the center of mass business, it still wouldn't be an, an exact ellipse. Um, sorry, it still would not be a closed ellipse. A closed ellipse meaning that it goes back to itself every time. Um, and that's just because gravity just isn't that simple. It's a little bit more complex than Newton had thought. Uh, and so you can look up the precession, the anomalous precession of Mercury, if you want to read more about that. Um, basically, the, orb, the, the ellipse itself rotates, uh, one of which is due to, uh, one of which is due to, um, sorry, uh, I, one of which is due to uh, general relativity. Um, thought when eccentricity is one, we get a parabola. Um, okay, so so there are uh, actually uh, so when I'm referring to the eccentricity of an orbit, uh, I'm referring to the to the value e here. There is a notion of eccentricity where you can say that an eccentricity of greater than one gives you a, a hyperbola, when an eccentricity of one would give you a parabola. That is that is true, and. Um, Actually, that might be true here. I'll, I'll, I'll work it out. You, you could be correct. The, uh, but how do I want to phrase this? Well, no. So, so, so it's true that when E approaches one, the orbits get, or the, her, the ellipse gets narrower and narrower, and the foci get closer and closer to the edge of the uh, ellipse, right? But uh, that, that is a true fact. Um, but I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there. We can talk about it more after, after lecture. Uh, I just want to blaze forward and maybe we can get Kepler's second law. So Kepler's second law is a fact. It's a slightly more uh, formal fact. It's, a, it's the statement that a line joining the sun, so you have to imagine this, a line joining the sun and an orbiting planet Um, sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. Now, this seems like a weird statement, but it's something that was observed by Kepler, and so he wrote it down. So again, you have your ellipse, you have your, uh, you have your say, the sun, and let's say you have, an, you have your orbiting body over here. So let's say that you have these two times. So let's draw the line. So this area, call it A1, takes some duration delta T1 to go. Like the, the, the orbiting planet will go around our, uh, our orbit in some amount of time, and it'll take some amount of time to sweep out that much area A1. Kepler, Kepler observed that in the same amount of time, say, let's call this delta T2, it will sweep out the same area, A2. That is to say, if A1 in these pictures equals A2, then delta T1 equals delta T2. So what's the implication here? The implication is that v2 average, the average velocity of the orbiting object over on this left-hand side is greater than the average velocity on the right-hand side, which is to say objects move faster when they're near perihelion 
than when they're near aphelion. Because otherwise, if they moved at, say, the same speed, then the area swept out by the, uh, the lines near aphelion would be much, much larger, because not only would the angle of the triangle be the same, <coughs> but the height of the triangle would be much, much higher. Um, one way to understand this is that uh, on the way from aphelion to perihelion, the object's trajectory is pretty close to in line with the actual gravitational force, right? Like this angle is small. Whereas when you're say, so, so it's almost like the object is just falling towards the sun, but it just barely misses. And so it get, picks up speed on the way towards the, uh, towards the sun. And then as it's leaving perihelion, it's, it's like it's shooting away from the sun, but the sun is pulling it back. And so it loses speed. Um, so Max asked, so, so, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to end it there. Uh, we'll talk about Kepler's third law and more on Friday. Um, oh, I shouldn't stop the share. I should stop the record. Uh, my bad.